Well, welcome to the Spring 23 Hybrid Literary Tea. We are going to have Dorothy Schiff Shannon. She's going to be our moderator here. And right here. So we can get started. Okay, um, I would say welcome again. I'm very happy to see you all here. And I think you're in for a treat. Uh, we've been having literary teas for I don't know how many decades, two or three, probably. And um, I'm not sure that we've ever really served tea. We didn't <laughs> serve them. <laughs> but it sounded good. And we always had a picture of a teapot on the cover. And um, so anyway, you can imagine drinking tea. Um, I'm actually drinking tea. <laughs> anybody else drinking tea? Uh, a couple of things I want to say again. Uh, please keep it quiet in here. Otherwise, the people on Zoom will not hear anything. And make sure your phone is off. Okay, I think we're ready. Is um, Pat Ballon here? Can I just ask, can everybody at home hear? Are you able to hear at home? Yeah, okay. Yes, I'm here, Dorothy. Okay, then so I'm going to screen share. Hang on, give me a minute. Okay, uh, this is the front of the booklet. Can you all at home see this? We can, yes. Okay, so we're going to start with Pat. Okay, Pat, let's go. Okay, this is called Old Acquaintance. Clunk, smack. The thunder and pelting rain masked some of the clunking. But after years of being alone at night, I knew the sounds of my house, and these were not like nothing I knew. Slipping out of bed and drawing my robe around me, I stealthily walked barefoot toward the noises. My neighbor's nightlight silhouetted a figure against the louvered window, and a boy was prying one of the louvers out with a crowbar. I made my voice gruff and octaves lower. Get out of here, I growled in a deep voice. The boy threw up his hands, dropped the crowbar with a clang, and fled. I hesitated, but finally called 911. Later, the police found an already detached louver near the crowbar and complimented me on my presence of mind. One of the officers told me that the boy and his confederate were caught two blocks away running through backyards to avoid detection on the streets. The police also mentioned the robbery of certain valuable Chinese vases stolen from a neighbor up the street and taken right out of the lighted niches which had been specially hollowed out to display them. This collection had been featured in our local newspaper with photos of the objet d'art, setting them up for the eventual robbery. I cast my mind back to a few months before, remembering that my husband Don had taken a teen under his wing and even invited him to our home. The youngster, Justin, was a floor sweeper at Don's gym. Justin asked if he might invite his friend Bob to join him in the visit. And Don, expansive and hospitable, gave the two a tour of our home, innocently showing off our well-stocked bar, the giant TVs, and other evidences of our luxurious lifestyle. Don even allowed them to see into my studio, where my own main vase and Tang horse figurine, both copies, were privately displayed. Bob, the older of the two young men, seemed to appreciate my paintings and lingered in the studio for a closer look. As an amateur sleuth and mystery story buff, it didn't take me long to suspect that the boys from the gym had tried to rob our house. But I never followed up on my hunch, nor did I ask the police the culprits' names. To spare Don's feelings, I certainly didn't tell him my suspicions either. He would have been crushed. 
and he'd have felt his hospitality betrayed. Fifteen or so years later, we were invited to a cocktail party at the home of new friends, Sue and Mark. Their son was visiting, and when they introduced him, here was that same Justin from years before, now all grown up. He greeted Don and me without self-consciousness. I searched his eyes for a sign of guilt, but found none, except that his eyes didn't blink when they met mine. I remembered that when my own young son had been caught in a lie, his eyes would grow wide and unblinking in a parody of innocence. I felt menaced when Justin circled behind me to take my coat, and the hairs on the back of my neck quivered. It was unreasonable and silly. Perhaps I was overreacting. I cast my eyes down so he couldn't see the suspicion in them. Now Don boomed. So, Justin, what have you been doing with yourself since the last time I, I saw you? Sue and Mark rushed to answer, tumbling over themselves to reply. Oh, Justin is in the importing business in Miami. And Sue added, he and his friend Bob handle some pretty valuable Chinese vases and things. Mark chimed in, old, very old stuff. In fact, he's up here for a Sotheby auction, hoping to get a good bid on a figurine from, what was it? The Ming Dynasty, I think he said. That's it. The end. Uh, Pat is an artist and a writer, and now we know she's also a detective. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, let's see, is Jane Cash here? Hey, is she on Zoom? <clears throat> I don't see her. Okay, well, if she comes Please in come later, back. she still gets her turn, but uh, <laughs> let's go to Joel Cohen. Let's go here. Mm -hmm. This is to Adam Cohn, Fordham Law School graduation, May, Rose Hill Campus, Bronx, New York. A few thoughts of a father. Today we return to the Bronx, to a location walking distance from where Grandpa Fred grew up, to where your great grandfather, police officer Reuben Kaplan, likely cracked some heads. The walk is a bit longer to Scott Tower, where I grew up with Booby, Grandpa Herb of blessed memory, and Aunt Barbara. It's not far from the young Israel of Mashiru Parkway, where I was bar mitzvahed, and whose rabbi married mom and me. Your sister was named there. It's not that far from where Booby's parents, George and Rose Unger, of blessed memory, ran their bottle business. We have returned this morning to the location of our family's roots, and not more predictably, to the borough of Manhattan, to the law school's majestic campus at Columbus Avenue and 62nd Street. We live our lives, time flies, Hopefully we accomplish some things of note, rarely a milestone such as yours. We do not reach these milestones alone. Our families have influenced us, guided us, shepherded us, and thereby share our accomplishments. This sharing does not, however, diminish the overall accomplishment. It's not a zero sum game. A decade or so ago, there was a popular expression which mocked spoiled youth. He was born on third base and thinks he hit a triple. This dig does not apply to you, Adam, nor for that matter to Michelle. You had nothing handed to you, but were simply blessed with a loving mother, father, grandparents, and of course, big sister. I could say more, but I'd likely incriminate or embarrass myself. To you, Allie, and your friends, continued success and only good things. Love, Pops. Thank you, Joel, and congratulations. It's nice that we can 
share with you your feelings <laughs> about your son, and it all sounds like a nice, warm family. Thank you for allowing me to memorialize. You're very welcome. Let's go to Michael. Wait, I think I said something. Yeah. Is it Michael? Mm -hmm. Okay, Michael. Stay here. Mike. Stay here. Yeah. yeah no, okay. Your turn. <laughs> All right. This is called Jeopardy. It's early winter in 1990. My wife and I have just made the trip to Murph Griffin's Hotel in Atlantic City so that I can humor myself by participating in a Jeopardy contestant search. I mushed into a large room where I and what seems like hundreds of others will be given a written test. This is step one. I nervously await, wait for the test results, and I'm somewhat surprised to hear that I will be able to move on to step two, a simulated game, after which I'm told that I have qualified to be on the show, if they can use me. That's not a guarantee, and I'm convinced that they will have more than enough New York horror type teachers with afros and mustaches. We go home. A week or so has passed. Finally, the call comes. Would I like to fly out to LA at my expense to appear on the show? I emit sounds that resemble, yes, of course, thank you. I arrive along with my wife and kids at the end of January. I've spent the intervening time studying. I've learned the sites of all 20th century Olympic games, the names of most of our vice presidents, and all sorts of other esoteric and forgettable information. It's Monday, January 31st. I arrive at the studio to meet my game show destiny. In spite of myself, I'm thinking of how much money I might win if things go right. I try to put it out of my mind. All five episodes for the week will be taped today. There are 15 contestants. We are given instructions and a pep talk, as well as a pile of documents and releases to sign. With a leap of faith, I skim them and sign. We've been told to bring changes of clothing for multiple games in the event that we win, an act of optimism that goes against my very nature. I'm introduced to a gentleman named David Epstein, which he conspicuously pronounces Epstein, who makes it clear to all of us that he is, in fact, the returning champion. I'm randomly chosen to be on Monday's show, facing off against Mr. Epstein and a very nice woman from somewhere in the Midwest. Alex Trebek keeps his distance as we get ready for the game. I guess he doesn't want to develop any preconceptions about us. Everyone not chosen for this game is seated in the audience, as are my wife and kids, right up front where I can see them. Finally, the game begins. I know most of the answers and I hit my buzzer, but nothing happens. I can't master the intricacies of hitting it after the light on the game board goes on as Alex finishes reading the answer. I'm frustrated. I keep getting locked out. The commercial break comes and my point total is zero. I begin to sweat a lot. During the break, I brought a glass of water, though I prefer vodka. <laughs> I'm told that I'm buzzing in too soon and I need to try to relax. Right. After the break, Alex interviews us, and one of my answers actually gets a laugh. I calm down a little. As we resume the game, I finally answer a question which I get wrong and plunge into the dreaded realm of negative dollars. I begin to have a sinking feeling, a combination of frustration, embarrassment, and disappointment. This is not going well. What if I end up with negative numbers? What will my students say? My friends, my kids. What about the money I stupidly have been spending in my imagination? <laughs> Somehow, though, I get on a roll, and as Double Jeopardy ends, I'm amazed to be in the lead. Time for Final Jeopardy. My confidence emerges. I can win this, and maybe the next four games. I can replace David Epstein as returning champion. Years before Hamilton, I decide I will not throw away my shot. I'll pay for Jess and Brian's college, and maybe have money left over. Alex announces the final Jeopardy category, museums. Okay, I know a little about this. I've been to the Met and MoMA. I took art history. I figured out how much David would have to wager to beat me, and I bet a dollar more than that. I'm ready. Here it is. Alex is reading it. On his death in 1936, he donated his Sarasota estate with its vast Rubens collection as an art museum. Wait, nothing about Van Gogh, Guernica, or the Mona Lisa? I stare blankly at the board. I see Elaine in the audience and I shake my head. I feel my face redden. My concern is obvious. I've never been much of a poker player. I have no clue. Time to guess. Let's see. Who was a rich guy who might have died in 1936? 
I scroll my answer on the screen thinking maybe my handwriting is so bad the answer might look correct. <laughs> Who was getting wrong? But of course, David Epstein knows the question. Who was Ringling? So David wins, a smug smile on his face. I've come in second and crushed. After the taping, Alex tells me what a great comeback I have made. David tells me that he knew it was Ringling because he had recently read an article about it. Thanks, David. I've always hated the damn circus anyway. I've won no money, but I do get garbage bags, QVL for leg cramps, a Jeopardy game, Centrum Silver, and a great trip to a resort in Malaysia. I'm invited to stay and watch the rest of the tapings. I decline, and we take the kids to Disneyland. A day or two later, we go home. Of course, it is 1991, the time of the Gulf War, and the State Department has issued a terrorism alert for Malaysia. <laughs> this is where they're sending me? And I said, that's not enough. The value of the trip is submitted to the IRS's income, and most school vacation times are blacked out. They refuse to change the trip. Not possible, they say. I forfeit the prize. The show airs on March 11th. When I get to work the next day, the door to my office is decorated with circus posters <laughs> and ads for the Ringling Museum. <laughs> sure. I love my friends. Despite my disappointment and the fact that I still have trouble watching the show, I remain very grateful for this experience, for my 30 minutes of fame, and for being able to meet Alex Trebek. Rest in peace, Alex. Thank you. Very good. Hey, uh, thank you, Mike. You might be an almost celebrity on television. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is Ben Ferrano here? Not yeah, he's here. He's on Zoom. He's on? Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? We can hear Hello. You. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Perseverance. When I was about 10 years old, I became addicted to reading books. When someone asked me what I wanted for my birthday or Christmas, I would always answer books. My mom bought me a subscription to a Zane Gray book club, which sent a new book every month. Zane Gray was probably the premier author of Western books, and I couldn't get enough of his writing. I read some of his books three times. He captured so much of the struggle in the early West and how determined people who moved westward were to establish a new life for their families. He treated conflicts with Native Americans in a much more humane way than did the Western movies at the time. <clears throat> However, if I had to pick one book that affected me most in my later adulthood, it would be Alexander Dumas, The Three Musketeers. I can remember getting it as a gift from my next door neighbor, Mary Herman, who was a middle-aged spinster whom I called Aunt Mamie. She was one of two sisters who took me to mass every Sunday since my parents weren't churchgoers. I can remember staying up all night to finish the book, but I began one late afternoon. I was mesmerized by the book's hero, D'Artagnan. I identified with this poor boy from Gascony who had the audacity to join the elite group of the Musketeers of the Guard. Although this is a swashbuckler novel, Dumas portrays various injustices, abuses, and absurdities of the regime, giving the novel an additional political significance at the time of its publication, a time when the debate in France between Republicans and monarchists was still fierce. I knew nothing of the historical context of the novel, but I saw myself as a poor kid from the Bronx who wanted to overcome any obstacle, obstacle to be recognized by the world at large. The quality that I subsequently embraced, which was paramount in D'Artagnan's personality, was perseverance. If you believe in something deeply, never give it up. Keep fighting, keep advancing, keep your target in sight. It served me well in pursuing an education, a career, a wonderful marriage, and a beautiful family. During my career, I had the privilege of being a mentor the 10 management associates, all young women. Their ethnic and racial backgrounds were quite diverse. Jewish, Chinese, Italian, Taiwanese, Croatian, African-American, Hungarian, English, Greek Colombian, and Irish. 
each at some point asked me what attitude or quality would best serve their careers. My answer was always the same, perseverance. Each was quite successful in their subsequent endeavors. So thank you, Alexander Dumas, son of a French nobleman and an African slave, for providing me with a role model early in my youth. Thank you very much, Len. I wonder how many kids today will find time for <laughs> deep reading when they're so busy with their technology. <laughs> Okay, uh, Bob Hayes is next. Hi. <clears throat> and Dorothy, my wife's a seventh grade teacher, and she happened to mention yesterday she thinks about maybe 10% of her students read anymore. Uh -huh. I was totally disappointed. That's really, that's really a sad number, you know? They, they won't get inspiration from the technology, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Well, anyway, here we go. Donna rolls into Rockaway. Donna came to visit the Rockaways on a mid-September's day in 1960. She came down from the beach, rose over Beach Channel Drive, the main drag in town, and right down our street, Beach 51st, if I remember correctly that far back. But fortunately for me and my family, we had heard she was blowing in, so we headed for higher ground. I only recall some of that day as I was only about three, three and a half years old. We traveled out to Roosevelt, further east on the island, to stay safe. We stayed at my maternal grandparents' house, the Heinemans. Outside the house that day, it was raining cats and dogs, as they used to say. At times, the wind howled so hard that I was very scared. Even in the safety of my grandparents' home, I, <clears throat> I knew I wouldn't get any playtime in a nicely treated backyard that day. Meanwhile, Back in Rockaway, Donna roared over the sand and boardwalk at Rockaway Beach. She headed north at fierce speed. Donna was determined to reach our house that day. She roared down the hill on Beach 51st Street. She never knocked or even rang the bell to our ground floor apartment. Instead, she blew through the side of the house and came right inside our living room. She rushed throughout the house, filling up all the rooms. Her immense strength pushed the front door wide open. Back in Roosevelt, I still remember how nasty it was that day, but it was nothing like what was happening back in Rockaway. My parents told me that Donna pushed my small bed over to the opposite wall. Keep this in mind for later. My mom had an electric singer sewing machine, the type in a nice wooden cabinet. Donna pushed it clear out the front door and down the street. My mom told me that a few days later, my paternal grandfather, Michael Hayes came in and dragged it out of the street. Supposedly, he brought it back to my grandparents' house in Jamaica. He tended to it in a small workroom. He totally disassembled it, removed any salt, and lubricated it. He brought it back to my mom, and she used it for many more years. After two or three days out in Roosevelt, we returned to our home, so home somewhat wet sweet home. But in the end, I felt there was a silver lining. When Donna had pushed my bed across the room, it exposed my lost silly putty. Even the immense strength of Donna couldn't enlarge my silly putty. Uh -huh. And that's the way it was, or at least from my young mind's eye. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Bob. I wonder how many of us remember this same hurricane. It must evoke a lot of other memories. I like the way you find humor in even such a terrible experience. <laughs> Thank you. I guess because my young age <laughs> at the time. <laughs> uh, Al, is Al here? He is. He's on Zoom. Al Jordan. Okay, let's go, uh, uh, I'm here. Oh. This is called uh, <clears throat> Summer Beach Club Memory, 1960. I started with a quote from Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. When I discover who I am, I'll be free. Jim, my boss, fired me from my busboy job. I could not face my parents without a job. They needed the money. 
I crossed Busy Ocean Avenue and walked south to the end of the eight mile boardwalk. Before me, in Emerald City Splendor, were miles of intimidating yet beautiful beach clubs. These magnificent historic fortresses with names like the Promenade, Breakwater, and Trade Winds stood as both guardians and gateways to the moody, restless, restless Atlantic. Within hours, I found a job as a pool porter <clears throat> at the prestigious Colony Surf Club built in the late 1920s. I joined the expendable legion of summer workers in mindless, low-paying, demeaning jobs that challenged self-esteem and personhood. I became Don Quixote armed with a broom and a long-handled dustpan. My job description was simple. Keep my area clean, mouth shut, respond promptly when summoned over the loudspeaker, stay out of the pool or ocean even after closing, and the cabanas were off limits. I was unimportant and declared invisible. I was a guest in a strange house. The famous and wannabes paid thousands of dollars to roast in the sun, be catered to, and for some, specialize in being rude and obnoxious. The white on white cabana boys ran errands, pampered and flirted with the older women for large tips. Their daily tips surpassed my weekly salary. The familiar smell of suntan lotion hung like a cloud in a sickening alliance with the restless, with the relentless humidity. Multicolored beach umbrellas polka dotted the hot white washed concrete landscape as the sun's only worthy opponent, but I cannot use them. My relief from the sun was long, risky, unauthorized breaks in the men's room or extended periods of needless sweeping in the shadow of an umbrella. I knew many of the girls who accompanied their parents. <clears throat> they were my classmates. Our eyes locked in recognition, but not a word was ever spoken. It was a cat and mouse summer. Most of the girls ritualistically bases themselves in suntan lotion, settled into, into the cushioned pool lounges and tested the limits of melanin as they turned in slow rotisserie rhythm. They never went near the water. Some read books, usually paperback romance novels, or caught up on required summer reading to kill a mockingbird, catch her in the rye, and raise it in the sun. Behind dark designer sunglasses was some serious boy watching. I smiled to think that in a few weeks, these same girls hope to catch my eye and join my exclusive circle as a high school basketball star. The all black custodial staff of five was too small, prompting us to work even harder. The other three pool porters were from up north in East Orange, a then thriving upperly mobile black middle-class community that capitalized on white flight. They were second generation college students, very rare back then, and rented rooms in a summer boarding house. Our worlds were very different, but a lot the same. I did not like them. They were too clannish, pretentious, and acted white in speech and manner. Their conversation focused on subjects such as fast cars, cotillions, a former ball of which debutantes are presented to society, in hopes of a future in something called a boule, which I later learned is an elitist secret society of selected successful black men. They never accepted my offer to play basketball in my neighborhood, yet I was careful not to alienate them. They were my ride to and from work. Mrs. Watt, a widow, was the matron for the bathrooms. She was a typical prayerful God-fearing church lady whom I called auntie. Years of domestic work left her without social security or a pension. Now in her late seventies, she was too old and frail to be working, especially in such a strenuous job and too proud to accept help from her grown children. Yet each day she faithfully boarded the bus for the 24 minute trip from Asbury Park. On several occasions, I found her in tears. How could a 15-year-old bring comfort to a person in his 70s whose heart and spirit were almost broken? Sometimes I did her job in mind, 
but other times I instinctively held her hand and repeated the words I heard my father say from the pulpit. In a preacher's soothing cadence, I said, Mrs. Watt, be patient. Your reward is yet to come. God has a blessing for you. I know, thank you, sweetest you, but with blessed assurance. My wide straw, my wide straw, my wide straw, bread, straw hat with the bright red, red uh, band was more than a fashion statement or protection from the sun. It was my declaration of independence. I refused to be invisible. And one day somebody did notice me from across the pool and yelled, you know, you know, in the South with that hat, folks say you down on the, on the, the levee, but in my old Brooklyn neighborhood, you would be down on the levee. I froze in my tracks. My spine stiffened. Many around the pool laughed out loud, but not me. It was frightening. I needed my job. I should have known that it was Bernie, the loud, affable, fast-talking owner of the food concession who seemed to chain smoke cigars. Al, I can see I need to teach you some Catskill humor. Come on, loosen up, he bellowed. For whatever the reason, Bernie liked me. He even arranged for me to come in early on weekends and help him open. I was paid off the books cash and access to free meals, a privilege I never abused. He began to teach me the trades, tricks of the trade and tell stories about his growing up. He told me that I reminded him of himself at 15, but I, I did not believe him at all. Admittedly, on some days I tried to avoid him. His friendship had a price. He asked me annoying questions about school, grades, homework, college, and future aspirations. I heard enough of that at home. Bernie was a very wealthy man who, unlike others I encountered, was not arrogant or aloof. He promised me that I could always have a job in his business, reassuring words for a kid fired only weeks ago. Each conversation with Bernie made me feel a bit more comfortable. With extreme caution, I began to trust him, but only just a little. I was always awaiting the other shoe to drop. With Bernie, it never happened. My job as a pool porter did not change. I did. It was still hot, annoying, low paying, and often demeaning. Yet I began to realize that my job did not define me. More importantly, I gained confidence with myself. If it takes a village to raise a child, in the summer of 1960, I had one. My parents always at the core, joined by Bernie, my coworkers, and even Jim, who had fired me. My first and last beach club, beach club summer job began and ended. I was 16 years old. That's it. Thank you, Al. Many times when Al reads his memoirs, we all in the class beg him to find a publisher. Mm -hmm. Maybe you feel that way as well. Uh, now it's Arnie's turn. Is Arnie here? Arnie Katz, are you online? He's not. Not here? Nope. Okay, then um, Phyllis, right. Phyllis here? Yeah. Okay. A rainy day. There was a big gray coal fired stove in our kitchen. It was always a mystery to me as to how the fire stayed burning. I often had to go down to the cellar and bring up a bucket of coal for the fire. That's where the coal bin was located. Every month or so in the winter months, I would hear my mother on the phone calling to have a ton of pea coal delivered. Coal came in various sizes according to the kind of stove or furnace that was in the house. It ranged from buckwheat, small pieces like peanuts, up to chestnut, much larger egg size and probably other sizes that I didn't know. We lived in Northeast Pennsylvania where the anthracite or hard coal was mined. There were many coal mines in the area known as Wyoming Valley, where the Susquehanna River ran through from upstate New York to empty into the Chesapeake Bay. 
These mines were the major source of employment for the residents of the valley. Anthracite coal was only found in this area of the United States. The tuminous or soft coal is more common and is found throughout the United States and other parts of the world. It burns more quickly and is very smoky. Often when it was quiet in the house and outside, I could hear the machinery in the mines operating when I was in the cellar. There were many accidents in the mines and it was dangerous and hard work. The mines were flooded out in 1958 when an unscrupulous mine owner mined too far out under the river. The water broke through and flooded all the mines in the valley. One day, I came home from school on a damp, cold, rainy day. I went around to the back door because my shoes were wet. When I opened the kitchen door, the most wonderful smell met me. My mother was baking bread. She sat me down in front of the big grave stove, opening the oven door to warm me and gave me a thick slice of warm bread with butter slathered generously on top. It was so delicious. Even today, when I smell fresh bread, I think of that day, the damp and cold walk home from school, the warmth of the kitchen, and my mother. <laughs> Phyllis, I love the details. You really take us to that place. <laughs> um, Martin Levinson, is he here? Marty, are you online? Not here. No. And Michael McCarthy, is he here? Nope. Michael McCarthy, no, I don't see anything. Okay, uh, Gary. Uh, yeah. Uh, Gary's here. Well, one morning, as I was uh, writing uh, writing fiction, I was it kind of occurred to me that uh, I was happy not to be suffering writer's block, so I. I figured I'd write a little light verse about what writer's block is called blank page. As I am mocked by this blank page, reminded that I'm not a sage, been at it since the last ice age, no words will come to mind. I think of people that I know, things I see, places go. For all this thought, nothing to show, no words will come to mind. I think of those who've long been dead, imagine what they might have said. I stroke my chin, I bang my head, no words will come to mind. I hug my kids, I kiss my spouse, I walk my dog, I clean my house, procrastinating like a louse, no words will come to mind. Oh wait, I think I have a plan, I'll write of how it all began. I throw my notebook in the can, no words will come to mind. You'd think this was a simple task, to write a book, not much to ask. I'll sell my soul, then wear a mask. No words will come to mind. The devil said it was no deal. I have no talent, he does feel. Can't write well enough to earn a meal, and that is being kind. He told me I'm a total hack. The writing skills are total lack. The devil's heart is oh so black. I have an axe to grind. I wrote about that Satan guy. 10 million books did readers buy. How's that for spitting in his eye? <laughs> I'll send him my books. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Gary, I think we all know what writer's block is. <laughs> you have uh, a lot of humor in this, you call it. Okay, Rachel. Um, this is one of the uh, group of nursing stories that I had written over the years as I was a registered nurse. I remember so the third or fourth one. Yeah, the third, I think. Right? Some, uh, I shouldn't apologize, but there are some words here that you may not be familiar with because they're medical terms. But, you know, afterwards, if you want to ask me, you can ask me. 
Okay, the Thanksgiving gift. Sam needed a liver transplant and was on the transplant list. Every couple of weeks, he came to our hospital for a paracentesis, his big belly filled with ascites fluid. After the procedure in the radiology department, which sometimes yielded four liters of fluid, he would need 50 grams of salt or albumin to replace some of the nutrients lost during the paracentesis. As a result, he would be with us in ambulatory surgery most of the day to be monitored. His wife was one of the sweetest people I ever knew and Sam no less sweet. He loved all our different personalities and we became attached to him. One day, he reported being called to go to Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. There was a strong possibility of a liver being available for him. He and his wife had waited all day with no updates, <laughs> only to learn that the liver was not a match. He went home disheartened. Months later, Sam received a liver the day before Thanksgiving. We knew this because he had called the radiology department from a pizzeria and told them he had gotten a Thanksgiving present. The much loved radiologist who had performed the paracentesis procedures over the years was so excited for him and his wife. He organized and paid for a dinner for Sam, his wife and family, and also included any staff member who had had any role in his care over the years from secretary to registered nurse. What a celebration to life that evening was. I look forward each year to your story. Mm -hmm. Thank you. She put them all together and put them in the book. How are you doing that? Well, oh, I've been urged to do that, but I don't have the discipline to do it. <laughs> I, I do share it with, with uh, student nurses that are just starting out, nurses that maybe I come across if I'm a patient or my husband's. I just give them away. Get someone to help you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let's go on. Uh, Brian Scott. I'm here. Good. We're kind of back to the devil now. <laughs> Satan and the sauce. With pasta on the battle plate, I carefully twirl angel hair noodles on my pitchfork and hold steady to win the round. But somewhere in the tournament, Satan loosens a drop of red tomato sauce to splatter on my bosom and boast a direct hit to my heart. I scream defeat and grab a moistened towel which bleeds it further across my blouse. Satan and his accomplice, the sauce, normally win, though I do not shrink from their challenge. Even when a glob of barbecue slides from a rack of ribs to brand my ribs, or a ruby-sized serving squirts from between layers of lasagna, or a single ketchup french fry dangling near my lips drips red on my shirt as if a stiff wind had changed its course. Defeated again, I cover my scarlet sin and finish my meal. Out, damn smock, I later lament to save my raiment and resolve. Disguising as vegetables, tomatoes are really fruits, in particular berries. When Eve chose the apple for her bite of knowledge, the tomato left Eden with its fake ID to travel with the notorious evildoer and leave its mark in games of gotcha. So when Satan calls forth only ketchup from the soup of condiments on my hamburger, and it coats my cheeks in rouge before sliding downward, raising the cost of a cheap meal to include the price of my shirt. I lose, but I do not surrender. Lured by any great marinara sauce, salsa, pizza, or chili, I return to outsmart the slippery speed and cunning of this devil and his staining sauce. Don't we all? <laughs> Thank you, um, Fran. We appreciate your humor and your poem. Thank you. Thank you for letting me read. <laughs> okay, uh, is Mary Ann here? Yeah. Yes. Yes, I am here. I am on uh, 
Okay. You can hear me, I hope? Yes. Yes, yes I'm ready. Okay. Uh, folding chairs. My cousin Maria comes by in the morning to walk me to school. I am new to kindergarten at four years old, soon to be five. Maria is seven and in second grade. It is 1954. She holds my hand as we walk four blocks under the blue September sky, sun bright as a yellow crayon. We wear plaid dresses with Peter Pan collars and Buster Brown shoes. Our dark hair is cut short, pixie style, with bangs reaching down to our somber brown eyes. We look like sisters. We go through the girls' playground and the girls' entrance, then the hallway to the kindergarten classroom where she leaves me with the smiling teacher. Maria is smart in school, I hear the old grandparents say. They are proud of her. They never got to go to school at all. I hope I will be smart in school too. The next year in September, we moved to a new neighborhood about 10 blocks away from the school in the opposite direction. I am almost six and can walk to school by myself. I do not see Maria anymore. Time passes. In sixth grade, my teacher picks me to be class representative at a seventh grade orientation to be held at our new school. Every sixth grade class in the city will be represented. The new school is in the heart of the hotel district of Atlantic City, only one block from the boardwalk. It is a venerable gray stone building, imposing and impressive. It will house a thousand of us seventh graders in September. We are seated in the front row of a large darkened auditorium looking up at the stage set up with a line of metal folding chairs. A teacher welcomes us and then introduces the eighth graders who now walk out and sit down. They are going to tell us what our new school will be like. One of them is Maria. I recognize her. I may have seen her in recent years at a family function here or there, but I don't remember. She's still tiny, diminutive, well-spoken, with a good, strong voice. What should we expect from this new place? It will be so much bigger than what we are used to. There are three floors and lots of staircases. We will have many teachers instead of just one. There will be so many kids. Every seventh grader in the entire city will attend. The work will be harder and there will be more of it, but the teachers will help us. Um, physical education will be held outside in front of the Claridge Hotel next to the boardwalk. The girls will need to buy ugly blue gym suits. We will be integrated. The black kids who had been previously hidden from us in their own neighborhoods will now be our classmates. We will step into a new phase of our lives. We will be mature and enriched. We will grow up into fine, well-educated young people prepared for the next level of education, high school. The program ends and we sixth graders are encouraged to mingle with the eighth grade presenters. The refreshment table is set up with Hawaiian punch and Lorna Dunes. I talk to Maria a little. We are both still shy and serious. A lifetime passes. I find myself thinking of Maria lately. I wonder why. I haven't seen her in over 50 years. I don't even know if she's alive. I think it's because I need an orientation. I want to sit in a darkened auditorium and look up at a row of metal folding chairs. I want Maria to come out with representatives of the generation ahead of us, the one that has disappeared. I want them to sit on the chairs in all their ectoplasmic glory and tell us what things will be like for us ahead. It will be so much bigger than we can comprehend. There will be so many people, some different from what we are used to. People will help us. We will be together with all of our loved ones. We will mature and grow as we prepare for the next level, whatever that will be. I want to socialize when the presentation is over and I want there to be Hawaiian punch and Lorna dunes or wine and trees. But I know there is not going to be an orientation. We of a certain age will have to find our own glimpses into what comes next. Sometimes we get signs, connections, but we have to make sure we are not inventing them just because we want them. Some believe that a cardinal song is a loved one speaking to you from beyond. Too easy. There are cardinals everywhere and they're singing because that's what they do. I hear my mother's skeptical voice whispering over my shoulder. A couple of years ago, I was walking on a wooded path with a dear friend on the first anniversary of her husband's death. 
my foot bumped into something on the ground, a small stone painted with flowers and the word courage in the middle. Tempting to believe there was a special message from the universe here, but I hear my mother's voice again, a likely a kind coincidence and nothing more. About a month ago, I had a dream, very vivid and colorful. I was with my husband's ex-wife, Pat, who had died a year or so ago and rather quickly. We were riding around in the East End looking for apartments to rent for Pat. It was summer, lush and green with flowers everywhere, more like Hawaii than Long Island. Pat was lovely and radiant as she had been in real life. We were both very happy. It was a nice dream. I wondered why I had dreamt of Pat. I did not think of her often. We were together at family functions over the years, but we did not do things together. We might have been friends had there not been the awkwardness of a shared family between us. Later that day, I was reading Rabbi Gelman's column in Newsday. I usually read it on Sunday, but I was a couple of days late. I must say that I love Rabbi Gelman ever since his days in the God Squad with Father Tom Hartman, now deceased. Rabbi Gelman had asked Father Tom to give him a sign, if he could, from the next world. And sometime later, a friend of the rabbis recounted a dream he'd had about a man he didn't know who gave him specific messages to give to Rabbi Gelman. It was the rabbi's father, also deceased. The rabbi got his sign. Today's column was on dreams. Rabbi Gelman talked about being open to the messages of dreams and how the deceased often use them to let you know they're all right. Then my glass of water spilled on Rabbi's column as if to make sure I was paying attention. I think in my dream this morning, Pat wanted me to let the kids know she was all right. Why would she choose me as the messenger? Because most of the family is not inclined in this direction. I overrode my mother's skeptical voice in my head. I told the kids about my dream and passed on Pat's message. I like signs that are hard to ignore. I attended a wedding shower some time ago where the bride-to-be was a nurse, as were her mother and most of the guests. In my conversation with a nurse who worked with seriously ill and dying people, I asked her if she had ever witnessed anything to make her believe in the continuance of the spirit beyond death. Not really, she said, but there was this one woman. She was delirious and she kept repeating, I see red shoes on the roof. There are red shoes on the roof. After she died, I sent a young orderly up to the roof and there were the red shoes. I cannot ascribe that story to coincidence. My mother's skeptical voice is silent. My new nurse friend and I walk to the refreshment table. There is no Hawaiian punch or Lorna Dunes, but I think of them. Wine and cheese will be okay. The end. Thank you, Marianne, for a moving and insightful and professional paper. Uh, Bob Stone is next. I'm here. <laughs> the pill box. On Sunday evening, I unlatched the boxes of my plastic pill counter. It has two rows, one side painted blue, the other red. I roll out seven morning pills for the blue side. I want to start my day with a blue sky. Then seven for the red side. Red sky at night, sailor's delight. <laughs> When I finish this task, I see the week filled before me. Every morning, one blue compartment empties. Every evening, one red compartment empties. And so, the days of my life count on. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. You've been out. He's an artist as well as a writer. And a lot of other things as well. And that completes our year of the year. Thank you. 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 Uh, acknowledge that Rhoda Spinner has joined us again as the uh, originator of this fine event for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And paired so, it for many years. Right. So, uh, a little cheers. Thanks, right? Thank you all for joining at home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.